Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, glad you could join us. I uh, know we're running a couple minutes behind, but I appreciate your patience today. Um, glad you could join us for the next hour or so um, as we talk about university traditions today. Before we get started, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping um, items. Uh, there is a Q&A app that we will use today if you are attending in the Google Hangout. Um, if you look to the left of your screen, um, there is a list or a list of icons. The fourth icon down, the fourth icon or so down, it says Q&A in a bluish green bubble. If you click on that, it will open on the right hand side of your screen. That will allow you to interact throughout the Hangout session today to ask your question. Um, once you once we get started, there'll be a uh, open area at the bottom where you can actually type text to submit your question, uh, and we will address them as they come in. Um, if you are watching via YouTube, you can use the under the stream on YouTube to submit your questions, and we will answer them as they come in as well during the Q and A session. Um, now. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. We have two wonderful panelists today that will help us uh, moderate today's discussion on traditions. First, we have Erin Laramore, who has worked as a, UN, um, a UNCG library archivist since 2011. In this role, she is responsible for managing the records that document the university's history from 1892 until present. Um, she guest lectures on the university history in the university history in courses across the curriculum, including history, English, kinesiology, African American studies, um, women and gender studies, um, and other courses as well. She holds a bachelor's of arts in English from Duke University and a master's of science in information studies from the University of Texas at Austin. He has previously worked in the Special Collections Library at the University of Tennessee at Knoxville, as well as North Carolina State University. We also have Dr. Bob Gatton, who received his bachelor's and master's degree from, uh, in biology from the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. He also earned his PhD in zoology from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. In Ann Arbor. He is an emeritus professor of biology at UNCG, where he taught undergraduate and graduate courses in animal physiology. Bob has published over 50 journal, journal articles and book chapters in the physiology of exercise, diving, hibernation, and food processing. He has served as the head of the Department of Biology and as the Associate Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences here at UNCG. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it over to Erin, and she's going to get us started today. Sure. Um, thanks, Crystal. Hopefully everyone can hear me OK. Um, I was going to basically kind of launch our talk about campus traditions by just running through a handful of the campus traditions that have some have come, some have gone, some are still around in some form, but just to introduce folks and get everyone talking. So the first tradition that actually dates back to the founding of the university would be campus literary societies. They, um, they were here since the very founding of the university. Charles McKeever, who was the president of the university, the founding president of the university, was adamantly opposed to selective organizations. So he actually fully banned um, fraternities and sororities in the kind of more traditional sense here on campus. He uh, instead went with literary societies, which I always, when talking to students, equate to the houses at Hogwarts. Basically, when you showed up, they sorted you into whichever house best suited your skill set, best needed your skill set, and that's who you were with um, over the course of your four years here. But one of the other traditions dating back almost to the founding of the university is the daisy chain. Um, you see a couple of pictures on the next screen of the daisy chain throughout the years. Um, it started in 1900. Essentially, the sophomores would create a chain, literally create a chain of daisies that they picked from a local field for the seniors to walk through at um, sometimes class day, sometimes graduation, and sometimes both. It's a tradition that lasted up into the late 60s, but 
The daisy is still the school color that comes from this. And actually, the gold in the blue and gold um, traces all the way back to this time. Prior to um, the mid-60s, our school colors actually were gold and white. And that was because of the daisy. It's one of many uh, graduation-related traditions that happened throughout the years, most of which have kind of faded away. I mentioned class day. Um, they also had things like tree day or tree night, sorry, where the class would plant a class tree, and park night, where they actually had a large um, presentation that they would give, a big play and performance. But class jackets are another one that's pretty, um, dates back pretty far, at least to the late 20s. That's how far we know. So basically, students would receive their jacket in a big ceremony during their sophomore year, and the jackets were colored with their class color. There were actually four colors that went into rotation green, red, blue, or lavender. And the lavender sometimes was replaced by khaki or a gray colored jacket. Um, the women were presented their jackets during the jacket day ceremony, where the entire sophomore class received their jackets and would march through the dining hall, wearing their jackets and singing their class song. And they wore these jackets to basically anything that was considered even moderately important to them. It's a tradition that ran through at least the early 70s. Um, we, we have jackets in our collection dating to, I believe, 1973, and none past that. But one of the other traditions that continues kind of in a different way um, from the earliest years through today is just a tradition of service and activism. This goes back to the early 1900s. One of the campus literary societies held a large women's suffrage debate on campus in 1909. But um, in the this goes back in the 19 teens, service, the word service, was adopted as the official motto of the school. Um, and, and that's actually something that kind of continues through today when you look at a lot of our community engagement. But during World War I and World War II, students were actually doing a lot to, um, to help out both campus and the community, the Greensboro community itself. But if you want to go to the next slide, the kind of seriousness of service opportunities wasn't the only thing that was happening during these times. The 1940s actually saw the start of Rat Day, um, R-A-T, Rat Day. Um, it was a, essentially a hazing period for freshmen at the start. Students were forced to wear the little rat ears that you see on the screen. And freshmen had to perform tasks like scrubbing the McKeever statue with a toothbrush. Um, as early as the 1950s, students were already protesting it, but it actually continued through the 60s, kind of shifting to a um, more of a community service model. Um, but it was it was it was certainly kind of a bonding exercise for both the freshmen and the sophomores who were doing the hazing, who called themselves the cats. So, civil rights and activism continued through, of course, but took kind of a different a different spin when we get into the 1960s. Um, most everyone is familiar with the civil rights protests, the sit-ins that happened um, at the Woolworths downtown in 19, February of 1960. There were a handful of women's college, which is what we were at the time, uh, students who participated in those sit-ins. And they actually wore those class jackets that I mentioned earlier, earlier which very visibly marked them as women's college students. And they were kind of continuing that greater tradition of service and um, community activism. It continued through in 1963. The petition that you see um, on the screen is actually a petition uh, basically calling for the desegregation of businesses on Tate Street. 1960 did not desegregate all of Greensboro. Campus, things that were considered then and still today to be pretty much adjacent and part of campus. Um, were still fully segregated in 1963. And so students led a protest um, of that that was ultimately successful as part of a much larger protest movement in the city of Greensboro. And then in the bottom corner, you see a picture from 1967 when the Student Government Association and many of the African American students who were here at the time organized a Black Power Forum. That's actually a picture from inside of the EUC. And, um, they brought in speakers from across the country, and they actually faced down a lot of protests that were coming from outside of campus. The Klan, the Ku Klux Klan, had actually threatened to come onto campus to stop the event, but ultimately it did go on and attract, as you can see from the picture, a good number of folks to listen to, um, 
listen to these really revolutionary speakers. So around this time period in 1963, that's actually July of 1963 is when the university's name shifts from Woman's College, which actually was the third name of the school. Previously we were the North Carolina College for Women and then before that the State Normal and Industrial School. But in 1963 we become the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and the UNC system declares that all of the schools in the system will be uh, co-educational. So in July of 1964, one year after that, that's when the first men undergraduate students um, are enrolled at UNCG. And as part of that, the campus wanted to really build an intercollegiate athletics program. Athletics had actually been a pretty big deal on campus from the founding. We had women here who were playing basketball, field hockey, um, of the tennis, and other sports here as early as the late 1890s but um, most of their competitions were intramural. They were between those literary societies or between classes, you know, the freshmen versus the sophomores. So it's not until the 60, late 60s that you really kind of see this growth in intercollegiate athletics. So in 1967, to be specific, the men's athletic team actually began competition and officially adopted the Spartan as, his, as the mascot for the athletic teams. And the women's team, um, women's teams kind of fell suit soon after. And you know, you see some of the pictures there, including in the bottom corner of the 1973 women's golf team, which was actually the very first team, athletic team on campus, to win a national title. So another campus tradition that's going to look very familiar to a lot of folks is the rock. Um, it actually came into being a little bit after that time period, so it actually popped up in the 1970s. Um, beginning in the 50s, students actually would start painting the McKeever statue um, in the same way that they paint the rock now. But needless to say, the McKeever statue was not looking too good after um, a lot of that. The, the cleaning solutions they were using started to take their toll and it was looking really sad. So in 1973, the Alpha Phi Omega um, fraternal organization, a service organization, purchased the rock. It was a 12.7 ton boulder that was actually from a quarry in Jamestown, so just outside of Greensboro, and it pretty much took the burden off of the McKeever statue and became kind of that official place for decoration. And so the final one that I wanted to mention, I mentioned at the very front that McKeever, when he started the university, was opposed to kind of Greek organizations being on campus. But in the 70s in particular, people really started advocating for these types of social organizations to be here on campus, especially now that the university had gone co-educational. Um, they really wanted it to be a, an environment that could foster hospitality for both men and women and allow them to compete more readily with uh, other schools that were nearby that did have fraternities and sororities. And so, to be honest, with a pretty decent deal of reluctance, um, administrators at, their at that time gave approval for fraternities and sororities on campus in late 1979, and it wasn't actually until 1980 that the first membership rush for fraternities and sororities started here on campus. But that's kind of the quick run through of many of these campus traditions, and now I think Bob's going to take it over to talk a little bit about um, you know, traditions that you all remember. Thank you, Aaron. And so I've been on campus only since 1978. So as you can gather, I'm, I'm new to some of these traditions that Aaron has talked to us about. So the, uh, the reason that I'm interested in this now is that, we, that UNCG is approaching our 125th anniversary. And so the question is, how can we commemorate and document uh, for our alumni, these traditions that have existed in the past, uh, some have gone away, some are still here, some are old, some are, are long-standing, some are, are, are relatively new and short-lasting. So how can we document those and make them available and to everybody to, to see what it is that makes this place uh, special in the sense of, uh, of the traditions that we've used? So our goal here today is to get your ideas about the traditions that you remember and think are important for inclusion. 
so um, the so what is a tradition? I looked at when I started working on this project. I looked up the word in several dictionaries, and so the, the my working definition of a tradition is a custom that is passed from generation to generation in terms of behavior and ideals and activities. And so at UNCG, what is a generation? What does it mean to say it's passed from generation to generation? Well, in, in my mind, the typical generation time at UNCG is four years. So if we have a tradition uh, that has lasted four years or more, I think that uh, qualifies in our sense of what is a UNCG tradition. So we're, I'm uh, working uh, with Aaron to collect these and make sure we're covering all the important things that our alumni and others think about things that, that characterize this place in terms of our customs over the years. So we, I, I've compiled a long list and uh, most of those things that Aaron has just mentioned. But what we want to do today is, is hear from you about the things that, that you consider a tradition so that we can con include your ideas in this compilation that we're working on uh, for our uh, 125th anniversary. Doesn't look like we have any questions coming in right now, but there's a bit of a problem on my computer. Are you all getting me? I'm, I'm hearing you. It's breaking up a little bit. Same here. Okay, give me a moment. Let me try to fix that audio. Hello? Yes. yes. Are you all able to hear me better now? Yes. yes. Awesome. Uh, so one question that I have, um, in, since we don't have any questions coming in right now, about the daisy chain. Erin, I know you shared earlier about that tradition um, that was started during women's college. And I imagine it doesn't necessarily um, in, uh, exist with the community now here at UNCG, but um, I know we have reunions and things of that nature. How is the, the J Daisy Chain now incorporated in the history um, of the university? Are they it still actually well predates the women's college era. It goes back to 1900, which is when we were state normal and industrial school. Um, so it goes way, way far back. Um, and it's actually a tradition that you actually saw at the time um, around in the late 19th, early 20th century at most women's, women's colleges. So you also would see it at places like Vassar and, um, and, and Smith and places like that. Okay. But um, so, you know, they would essentially just kind of go to a field in kind of later years of the daisy chain once it became a solid tradition. Um, the university actually would have fields that were designated as the daisy chain fields where they would grow daisies so that they could go and, um, and pick them. But, um, you know, I think today you do see daisy chains pop up at reunion. You do see daisies planted all over the campus, to be honest. But, um, you know, we, we aren't stitching together the chain the way it used to be done and haven't really done that since about 68, 1968, 1969, somewhere around there. But you do still see, again, the daisy is the school's official, it's the official school flower. And the gold and the blue and gold is a remnant of the gold and white that used to be the school's color during the women's college and earlier eras um, that, that were color selected specifically because they reminded folks of the daisy. Okay. Another tradition that I've uh, a lot of people have mentioned to me is, is the luminaries. Uh, at Christmas time, and so uh, these are are the sorts of things we want to include: the daisy chains, the luminaries, the so the academic rigor, um, and and those are things that I want to be sure to include. So um, okay, so we have a, a question here: How would an alum alumni uh, find out about the history of their department? or major. I would be interested in learning about the formation of the UNCG's dance department. 
One way would be to uh, check our archives, and I'll let Aaron, I think Aaron is the one to, to talk about that and tell you how to, to get into the huge amount of data uh, that are available digitally. UNCG has a wonderful digital archive, so if you are sending this message, you can, you, and are capable of, of hearing this broadcast and sending an email, you can dig into these wonderful archives that are digital. So Aaron can follow up on that, but I, I think you can find what you want. Aaron? Yeah, um, I'm going to attempt a screen share, so we'll see if that works. Um, so I wanted to basically, are you guys able to see the screen? Yes. Are you able to see my, my desktop? I think when you hit the share, it, uh, it showed me. Okay. Uh, on your screen, so I guess that it was showing the Google Hangout. Do you have multiple screens, Erin? No. Okay. Let's see if that works. Yes, yes. Yeah. So this is what I wanted to bring folks to. Basically, um, if you, there's a long web address that you can see there at the top, but um, if you actually just try, type in library.uncg.edu slash archives, then that um, will bring you to this page as well. And there you can see the array of materials that we have online to help people conduct research, whatever their research purpose may be. And um, we have finding aids, which basically are the resources that can guide you towards the records that we have here on site. Um, which is thousands and thousands and thousands of linear feet of records dating back to the 1890s um, through, you know, things that were created just a little while ago. The UNC web, UNCG website's archive is actually um, every six months, we essentially create a snapshot of the UNCG website. So if there's something that you know was on a UNCG website um, in 2015, but it's not there anymore, you can go to that site and see what it looked like. A good example is actually, um, you know, we have a snapshot of the website that was up um, when we were conducting the search for our current chancellor, but of course the search website is no longer up. So if you wanted to investigate that website and learn more about it, that would be your place to go. Um, the thing that's probably going to be most useful, or the three things that will be most useful to folks, um, searching for the history of their departments, organi student organizations, anything like that, or down here under research resources. Um, digitized university history, which I'll come back to in a minute. This is material that we've scanned. It only represents maybe, I'd say, about a tenth of what we have in total, but it's a lot of the really important stuff. We also have an online encyclopedia of UNCG history that we're actually working through currently. It's a big project that we're working on that um, is pretty much going to be ongoing, but if you look at it, you can actually find, if you look at the entry list, that a lot of departments, a lot of buildings, a lot of people are in here already, and if you wanted to learn more, you asked about dance, which is one we haven't gotten to yet, but if, for instance, you wanted to learn about the English department instead, you could actually just click on the English department here, and it's going to bring you up a history of that department, along with a history of the department heads um, or chairs, whatever they happen to be called at the time. Um, and then our Spartan Stories blog publishes every Monday morning a story from university history. Um, there are tons of, of stories about different departments, different organizations. So. One of our most recent was actually about the Department of Nursing Education that actually existed before the School of Nursing was opened. And so a lot of times you can click there, search in the box in the top, and find a story that's been written about um, a department, a place, or a person. But the digitized university history resources are the richest source of information that we have. And you can kind of see the vast array of materials that we've digitized here. Um, we're actually working right now through um, the School of Music recital programs. Um, hopefully we will have those completely online within the next few months. We actually have a run of the campus theater productions going up until 1963. Um, we have oral history interviews that have been conducted with lots of faculty, administrators, 
students um, throughout the university's history. There's a strength um, just because of timing with folks who've been here from the 1960s forward, but we've tried to do a full range of um, departments, tried to reach across different areas. We also have scrapbooks. Many of the departments created scrapbooks. Many student organizations created scrapbooks. Um, back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, each class would create a class scrapbook that would trace their time here on campus. So those have been digitized completely. And then the campus publications, which is kind of the source that is most useful for digging out resources. We've digitized the full run of the Alumni News slash UNCG Magazine. So essentially the magazine that was being created and sent to alumni. Um, those have been digitized in full. We've digitized the Board of Directors reports from the first, I'd say, 15 years of the school. Those are essentially kind of the, the grand end of the year annual report for the university. The bulletins and course catalogs, we actually have all of the course catalogs digitized up until they stopped printing them. So if you ever needed to trace what courses were being offered by the Department of Dance in 1963, you can actually click that and you can see one for each year. And dance was not taught in that first year, but I'll open this one up anyways. You can just click and page through and look and see um, who taught here, what the departments were, what classes were being offered. Um, a lot of times it'll also talk about the requirements for students. So those can come in really handy. We've also digitized the full run of the Carolinian, the student newspaper, as well as all of the yearbooks that were published. Um, the yearbook stopped publication in 1993, but those can be really handy to help find that. Awesome. So that's a fast and quick run through of all of the resources that are online. But to be honest, if folks just remember library.uncg.edu slash archives, you're, you'll be set and be able to find everything you need. Thank you for sharing that, Erin. Um, I have another question um, with regards to the rock you mentioned. So years and years and years have passed, and, and students are still utilizing the rock to advertise and publicize different events and things that are going on on campus. Are the 30, 40 years of paint still on that rock, or do they ever so often peel that off? Like, how does that work? I have no idea. <laughs> that would be an excellent question for facilities. <laughs> I'm just wondering if, 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 if that, that's uh, how that works. But um, I would assume at some point they peel it off solely because uh, I used to work at the University of Tennessee where they also have a rock that they paint. And when it gets really, really hot, it peels off. Gotcha. And they'll peel off an inch thick chunk of paint during the summer. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Um, and so is, are, just thinking about what we've cataloged over the years for the history of the university, um, do we have any periods of time that we don't have as much information in archives for um, that maybe we could make an all call or solicitation to um, the community to provide that, that, that information? And if so, how would they go about doing that? Yes, um, we're always looking for materials from student organizations. Those tend to be the trickiest um, things on campus to document. Um, we have pretty good records from, I'd say, going up until the late 60s. Um, and, you know, we, we have full runs of yearbooks and class jackets, and, you know, we've digitized all the materials in, the, in that vein, so we have a lot of that. But, you know, it's really hard to, to, to document a student organization when they change up leaders every year, it's hard to train new people every year on how to transfer materials. Right. And so um, going back to that, that same web page, there's contact information on our web page. And if people have records kind of hidden away somewhere that document a student organization here on campus during pretty much the 70s forward, um, we would like to hear from you. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Okay. So let, let me make a suggestion that uh, for those of you participating in this that have memories about traditions here, if, if you would like to send those to me, 
I would be happy to receive them and try to incorporate them into uh, this list and this document that we're going to produce. So um, I and I'll of course share all of this with Aaron. So none of this will be lost in any way. So uh, if you send those to me, I would be delighted to receive them. And so my email address is Bob. Dot Gatton, G A T T E N, at Gmail. Dot com. Um, I, since I'm now an emeritus professor and retired, uh, I prefer to receive the, these messages uh, by my private email rather than my my old uh, UNCG email account. So again, it's Bob. Dot Gatton, G A T T E N, at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you. Thank you. And we'll make sure that we include your information whenever we post the recording um, of this session so that if anyone watches it and they don't catch your email for some reason, they can reach out to you that way as well. Um, okay. Doesn't look like we have any more questions coming in at the moment. Um, we do have quite a few viewers on, but no questions are coming in, and that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Um, so it doesn't look like we're going to take the entire hour today. Um, so, you know, if you guys are ready to wrap up, I'm more than happy to go ahead and close things out today. Great. All right. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for joining us in this installment of the Spartan Share Series. Be sure to check us out next week, uh, Wednesday, April 27th at 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for our first time home buyers panel where we will have professional a mortgage professional a real estate professional as well as a real estate attorney to talk about the home buying process from beginning to end and answer all the questions that you may have uh, we look forward to seeing you then thanks and everyone have a wonderful day bye thank you